Hello, my name is Roisin and welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you've been here around here a while, you will know that every three months I talk you through some of the upcoming releases for which I am excited. Sometimes I split them up into historical fiction and the best of the rest, uh, but for this three months I've decided just to do one video and only talk about ones that I'm really excited for. So I've got 23 books to talk to you about, um, and so I think I better dive straight in. I will just say, um, I'm not going to say all the release dates here because um, I always forget, um, and so I've only done it for half of them, but I will leave it in the description, a list of all these books and when they are coming out. So the first one on my list is The Turban and the Hat by Sonala Ibrahim. And this is a novel about the invasion and occupation of Egypt by Napoleonic France. So this is historical fiction um, and a time period I know nothing about at all. Those three tumultuous years from the perspective of a young Egyptian living in late 18th century Cairo. Knowing some French, he works as a translator for the occupiers. He meets their scientists and artists, has an affair with Bonaparte's mistress, and accompanies the disastrous campaign to take Syria, where he witnesses the ravages of the plague and the horrific barbarism of war. He is astonished by the invaders' lies and propaganda, but he finds that much of what he thought he knew about his fellow Egyptians was also an illusion. The Turban in the Hat is a story of resistance, but also of collaboration, cooperation and corruption. So yeah, as you may know, I love historical fiction set in time periods I know very little about. I love 18th century historical fiction, um, so very excited to read this one. It sounds um, like it's going to be a really interesting read, a look at colonialism and resistance um, from a perspective of a country being colonised by the French, which again is not something I've read a huge deal amount about. Next on my list is Benefit, which is a novel by Siobhan Phillips, um, and this is one about Laura, a student from a modest background who escapes her small town to join the ranks of the academic elite on a Weatherfield Fellowship to study at Oxford University. She enthusiastically throws herself into her coursework, yet she is never able to escape the feeling of unease and dislocation among her fellow chosen students of promise and ambition. Years later, back in the US with a PhD and dissertation on Henry James, she loses her job as a professor and reconnects with the Weatherfield Foundation. Commissioned to write a history for its centennial, she becomes obsessed by the Gilded Age origins of the Weatherfield fortune, rooted in the exploitation and misery of sugar production. She is lured back into an abandoned friendship with the gleaming, glimmering group. She discovers hidden aspects of herself and others that point the way to a terrifying freedom. It's about like toxic philanthropy and the way that rich people have historically and continue to use money to launder their reputations. Um, and this one has been praised by Jenny Offal, Susan Parabo and Jessica Winter an exploration of the precarious island of academic life and the cold unforgiving waters that surround it. Kind of closed world and I love books about that kind of closed world um kind of give that small town vibes when it's but it's actually about a world and a really specific culture. The next one is a new release from uh, an author who I've read a book from before and absolutely loved and you've probably seen it all over bookstagram and booktube and this is People Person by Candace Carty Williams. So I read and loved Queenie um last year I think or maybe even the year before um, I absolutely love the book and it is set in sort of my area of South London where I'm from um, it's set in Brixton I'm from Crystal Palace they go to Crystal Palace for the fireworks like it's all that sort of corner of South East London. I didn't just love it for that, it was also well written, a very interesting exploration of um, Queenie's psychology. But anyway, this is her new <laughs> novel, which is about um, Dimple Pennington, who knows half of her siblings, but she doesn't really know them. Five people who don't have anything in common except for faint mem memories of being driven through Brixton in their dad's gold jeep, and some pretty complex abandonment issues. Dimple has bigger things to think about. She's 30 and her life isn't really going anywhere. An aspiring lifestyle influencer with a terrible and wayward boyfriend, Dimple's life has shrunk to the size of a phone screen. And despite a small but loyal following, she's never felt more alone in life. That is until a dramatic event brings her half-siblings, Nikisha, Danny, Lizzie and Prince, crashing back into her life. When they're all forced to re reconnect with Cyril Pennington, the absent father they never really knew, things get more complicated. I'm sure this one's going to be wonderful with really great characters and um, an interesting look at all of those topics, um, so I'm really looking forward to it. Also, um, interesting <laughs> that when Queenie came out, I was the same age as Queenie, and now I'm nearly 30, I'm going to be the same age as Dimple, so um, I feel like me and Candice Carty Williams might also be the same age. Next, another book from a author that I've read from before. This is The Garden of Broken Things by Francesca Montplacier, and I read um, I read a horror novel from Francesca Montplacier that I can't remember the name of um, but this one um, she's a Haitian writer and this is a novel about a family wading through the aftermath of the earthquake that devastated Haiti in 2010 um, but it was written before the 
next devastating earthquake that hit Haiti in 2021. And this is about Genevieve, a single mother who flies from New York to Port-au-Prince with her teenage son, Miles. The trip is meant to be an education for 15-year-old Miles, a chance to learn about his family's roots while coming to terms with his father's departure. But it's also an excuse for Genevieve to escape the city where her life is dominated by her failed marriage and the daily pressures of raising black children in America. For Genevieve, the journey is also a homecoming of sorts, and the opportunity to visit the island she remembers from childhood and reconnect with family. But when the country is rocked by a massive earthquake, decimating the city and putting their lives at risk, their visit becomes a nightmare of survival. So as I said, the last book I read, um, which was called My Mother's House, I think, um, and it was quite dark um, and a horror novel and really, really evocative of like, what's the word I want? Like an atmosphere. It was very atmospheric novel, very darkly atmospheric. So I think that that sort of dark atmosphere is going to come through again. And it also had a lot of rhythm and beauty to the writing, which I enjoyed. So I'm um, looking forward to reading another book by Francesca Montplacier. Also on my list is Sunken City by Marta Barone, um, and this one has been praised by Thomas Yerdovsky, who wrote Swimming in the Dark, which was one of my favourite books of 2020. Um, and this is about newly bereaved, bookish and lonely in Turin, a young woman sets out to chronicle her father's secret lives and her struggle to accept his loss. She is startled to discover that the gentle mercurial doctor was sentenced to jail in 1986 for membership of an armed band. Her father, L.B., lived through the years of lead, a time of unrest where extreme factions of left and right took hostages, set bomb bombs and murdered their countrymen. Unable to move on before she can f understand her family's past, she goes in search of him, and ultimately of herself too, the only way she knows how, by reading everything she can. Through her search for the truth, a very different picture starts to emerge. Sort of late 20th century in Europe is something that I would like to read more about. Um, this one is set in Italy, in Turin, um, and, but this period of unrest is something that I don't know very much about, um, so I would like to read about that. Um, and as I said, it was praised by Thomas Yerdowski, who said, I was captivated from the first page and I know Marta's unique voice will stay with me for a long time. One that I have a um, proof copy of, a digital proof on NetGalley, is Wildfires by Sophie Jai. Um, and so I'm hopefully going to read that one fairly soon. Um, this one, the only thing Cassandra knows about her family are the stories she's heard in snatches over the years. About the aunt and cousin she never got to meet, about the man from the folded up photograph in one of her aunt's drawers, and of course about her cousin Chevy, and why he never speaks, but no one utters a word about them anymore. When a call from one of her sisters brings Cassandra's news of Chevy's death, she has to return home for a funeral, to Toronto and the big house on Florence Street, where her sisters are hiding more than themselves in their rooms, where the tension brewing between her mother and aunts has made, been decades in the making, and where sooner or later every secret, unspoken word and painful memory will find its way out into the open. Moving between Toronto and Trinidad, Wildfires is a vivid and compelling story exploring the ways we mourn and why we avoid the things that can save us. I think something that I am seeing as a theme that's coming out like in the last book and this book is that I like generational stories where one of the generations is exploring the earlier generation. Um, I prefer that than generational stories where the only connection is that they're related. I like this sort of discovery element that's happening in both Wildfires and Sunken City. Also on my list is Young Women by Jessica Moore. Um, and this one is about Emily, who, when she meets the enigmatic and dazzling actress Tamsin, her life changes. Drawn into Tamsin's world of Soho living, boozy dinners and cocktails at impossibly expensive bars, Emily's life shifts from black and white to Technicolor and the two women become inseparable. Tamsin is the friend, the friend Emily has always longed for, beautiful, fun, intelligent, mysterious, and soon Emily is neglecting her previous life, her work assisting vulnerable women, her old friend Lucy, to bask in her glow. But when a bombshell news article about a decades-old sexual assault case breaks, Emily realises that Tasman has been hiding a secret about her own heart past, a secret that threatens to unravel everything. Um, so I, I like books about this kind of toxic, obsessive friendship, um, but I've only read a few, so I would love to read more, and this one sounds like it's going to be up that um, up the, in that direction. Um, it's also one that's been like highly praised um, as by Jeanette Winterson and by Sarah Collins, both of whom are writers that I have read from before and have liked. Sarah Collins called it tense, beautiful and lyrical, um, which are all three <laughs> buzzwords that make me want to read a book. One that I have seen absolutely everywhere on Bookstagram, and I think it's because the cover is lovely, um, and those colours are gorgeous, um, and that is We Had to Remove This Post by Hannah Bervotes. Bervotes. Apologies, I cannot pronounce that surname very well. But um, I also think that it's because like it's about social media, so it's going to get a good social media reception. But this one is about um, Kaylee, who is a content moderator and sees humanity at its worst. But she needs money, and that's why she takes a job working for a social media platform whose name she isn't allowed to mention. 
her job reviewing offensive videos and pictures, rants and conspiracy theories, and deciding which need to be removed. It's gruelling work, and she spends all her days watching horrors and hate on her screen, evaluating them with the platform's ever-changing moderating guidelines. Yet she is good at her job, and in her college she finds a group of friends, even a new girlfriend. But soon the job seems to change them all, shifting their, words, their worlds in alarming ways. How long before the moderator's own morals bend and flex under the weight of what they see? So of course it's getting Black Mirror comparisons because it's about modern technology and human um, nature so obviously that's Black Mirror-esque um, but it's also been praised by Ling Ma who wrote Severance and Ian McEwan. Sorry my camera just died so um, if I'm in a slightly different position that's the reasoning. Next on my list is The Island of Forgetting by Jasmine Seeley um, and this one is Iapetus, a lonely soul haunted by the memory of his father, his son Atlas, dreaming of life far removed from his reality, Atlas's daughter Calypso, struggling to find her place in an unforgiving society, and her son Nautilus, grappling with various parts of, comp of a complex identity. Each of them longs to escape, to go beyond the borders and circumstances that have contained them for so long, but each finds that they are trapped by a history found only in whispers and half-remembered fragments, and that it is dictating a future over which they have little control. With every passing decade, another generation must contend with the same doubts about their identity, about the place in the small world they have carved out for themselves, and the same question. How can things we don't know define our futures? So that sounds really interesting, but what mostly interested me is that the characters are called... Iapetus, Atlas, Calypso, and Nautilus. So I feel like there's going to be some sort of like mythology or uh, gods and things involved in that, at least sort of referenced, if not literal. Um, but I might just be making assumptions based on those names and it might just be to do with the sea. Then one that I, I'm interested in because it's been compared to the Regeneration trilogy by Pat Barker, which I love, but it is a First World War trenches novel, um, which I read a lot of when I was a teenager and I'm not really sure I'm that into anymore. So I'm feeling mixed feelings about this one. Oh, did I say what it's called? This is The River Twice by John Benrose. Set in a small factory town where residents are reeling as the wounded return and the lists of local young men who have been killed continues to grow. Wounded in body and spirit, Ted Whitfield returns home from the trenches to his wife Miriam, who finds it him deeply altered and virtually unreachable. Her sister Grace, afflicted by her own secret trauma, falls into an immediate and electric affinity with Ted, and soon he is telling her, and only her, a story from the front lines that is as shocking as it is extraordinary. As the novel moves back and forth between the lush rolling landscape of southern Ontario and the devastated French countryside, where exhausted Canadian troops are entrenched, the three characters at the centre of a narrative become entwined in an almost unbearable, unbearable conflict. Miriam and Grace's nine-year-old brother Will, a thoughtful, quiet boy who often sees adults more clearly than they see themselves, is at the center of the story so yeah I'm um, unsure because I feel a bit conflicted as I said about World War One novels but hopefully that one will be good because it's been compared to the best World War One novels so one that's got two names and I'm not sure which one it is coming out under in the UK we've got Garden of Earthly Bodies um, which is also called The Weight of Loss which is by Sally Oliver um, and this one I think is going to be one of those weird books um, I love books that are slightly strange um, and do weird surreal things and I think this one is going to be that months after her sister's death Marianne wakes up to find a growth of thick black hairs along her spine they defy her attempts to remove them instead proliferating growing longer Marianne's doctor tells her they are a reaction to trauma developed in the wake of the loss of her sister her doctor recommends that Marianne visit Need a modern new age rehabilitation centre in a remote forest in Wales yet something strange is happening to Marianne and the other patients at Need a metamorphosis of a kind as the hairs on her back continue to grow, the past starts to entangle itself with the present, and the borders of her consciousness threaten to disintegrate. She finds herself drawn compulsively to the memory of Marie, possessing over the impulse that drew her sister towards death and splintered her family apart. As Marianne's memories threaten to overwhelm her, Need offers to release her release from this cycle of memory and pain, but only at a terrible price. So yes, this could be a bit um, more plotty than I generally like, but hopefully it's just a bit weird. And it says it's haunting, lyrical and introspective, which again are three buzzwords that I love. On my list is Greenland by David Santos Donaldson. In 1919, Mohammed El Adel, the young Egyptian lover of British author Ian Forster, spent six months in a jail cell. A century later, Kip Starling has locked himself in his Brooklyn basement study with a pistol and 21 gallons of Poland Spring to write Mohammed's story. Kip has only three weeks until his publisher's deadline to immerse himself in the mind of Mohammed, who, like Kip, is black, queer, and other. 
The similarities don't end there. Both of their lives have been deeply affected by their confrontations with whiteness, homophobia, their upper crust education, and their white romantic partners. As Kip immerses himself in his, in his writing, Muhammad's story, and then Muhammad himself begin to speak to him, and his life becomes a Proustian portal into Kip's own memories and psyche. Greenland seamlessly conjures two distinct yet overlapping worlds where the past mirrors the present. So, um, I, like Ian Forster, um, and also the rest of this novel just sounds really fascinating and interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to read that, a bit of a mixture of historical fiction and um, something more contemporary. Now, one that I wouldn't have put on this list, because I really don't like the cover, um, but it has been um, described as a book that will be loved unreasonably and lifelong like I Capture the Castle by Francis Bufford. Um, and I Capture the Castle, one of my favourite books of all time. Francis Bufford um, wrote Golden Hill, which I really loved, um, and also taught um, <laughs> taught at my university when I was getting my Masters in Creative and Life Writing. Kind of what drew me to this book, um, because I really don't like that cover, but... Christabel Seagrave has always wanted her life to be a story, but there are no girls in the books her dust in her dusty family library. For an unwanted orphan who grows into an unmarriageable young woman, there is no place for her in a traditional English manner. But from the day the whale washes up at the beach in Chilcombe Estate in Dorset, and 12-year-old Christabel plants her flag and claims it as her own, she is determined to do things differently. With her step-parents blithely distracted by their endless party guests, Christabel and her siblings Flossie and Digby scratch together an education from the plays they read in their freezing attic, drunken conversations eavesdrop through oak panel doors, and the esoteric lessons and, their e and the esoteric lessons of Maudie their maid. But as children grow to adulthood and war approaches, jolting their lives into very different tracks, it becomes clear that the roles they are expected to play are no longer those they want. As they find themselves drawn into conflict, they must each find a way to write their own story. So even that blurb is not hugely interesting me, but I've got hopes for it. I've got high hopes. Next, a novel called Horse by Geraldine Brooks, who has won the Pulitzer Prize before. Um, this is another bit, this is another um, story that crosses different time periods. Um, so we have Kentucky, 1850. An enslaved groom named Jarrett and a bay foal for, forge a bond of understanding that will carry the horse to record-setting victories across the South. When the nation erupts in civil war, an itinerant young artist who has made his name on paintings of the racehorses takes up arms for the Union. On a perilous night, he reunites with the stallion and his groom, very far from the glamour of any racetrack. New York City, 1954. Martha Jackson, a gallery owner celebrated for taking risks on entry contemporary painters, becomes obsessed with a 19th century equestrian oil painting of mysterious provenance. Washington, D.C., 2019. Jess, a Smithsonian scientist from Australia, and Theo, a Nigerian-American art historian, find themselves unexpectedly connected through their shared interest in the horse. In the horse, One studying the stallion's bones for clues to his power and endurance, the others uncovering the long history of the unsung black horsemen who are critical to his racing success. I was not a horse girl growing up, I was a dolphin girl, um, but I still think that this sounds like it could be a really interesting uh, way to explore these different periods of history. Next is Chilean Poets by Alejandro Zambra. After a chance encounter at a Santiago nightclub, aspiring poet Gonzalo reunites with his first love, Carla. Though their desire for each other is still intact, much has changed. Among other things, Carla now has a six-year-old son, Vicente. Soon the three form a happy sort of family. Eventually, their ambitions pull the lovers in different directions, in Gonzalo's case, all the way to New York. Though Gonzalo takes his books when he goes, Vicente, Vicente inherits his stepfather's love of poetry. When, at 18, Vicente meets Prue, an American journalist literally and figuratively lost in Santiago, he encourages her to write about Chilean poets. Not the famous dead kind, Neruda, Mistral, bon Bolano, but rather the living, striving, everyday ones. Prue's research leads her into this eclectic community, another kind of family, dysfunctional but ultimately loving. Will it also leave Vicente and Gonzalo back to each other? So I want to read more books from Latin America, and so that's one of the reasons that I was drawn to this one, um, and also because I am interested in poetry, so a kind of novel about poetry. I think it sounds like an interesting premise. Another one whose cover I don't love is The Return of Faraz Ali by um, Amin Ahmad, uh, but it has been pra praised by um, Yar Jassi, who says it's a rich, deeply moving novel about confronting histories both personal and political, and Mazo Mengiste, who wrote uh, The Shadow King, which I loved. Um, I will see arrival of a strikingly accomplished and mature talent. Akhmat has managed to meld fast-paced, intelligent noir with a devastating portrait of the true costs of ambition and desire. So those praises made me more interested than the cover. In Pakistan during the anarchic late 60s, 
As riots erupt on the streets of Lahore, Inspector Faraz returns to his birthplace, the red light district in the ancient walled city where women still pass on the profession of courtesan to their daughters. Plucked from it as a small boy by his influential father, Faraz has kept his roots well hidden. Now his father has sent him back, sent him back to cover up the murder of a young prostitute. It should be a simple task in the marginalised community, but Faraz finds himself unable to obey orders or to resist searching for the mother and sister he left behind. Tracing down the walled city's labyrinth and alleys for answers that risk casually shattering his carefully constructed existence, he is unaware that his sister faces having to return to, to a life she thought she had escaped. So, as I said, I like to read books from uh, around the world. I don't think I've read much set in Pakistan, um, but that sounds really interesting. And also a bit more plotty than something I would usually read. But next on my list is True Biz by Sarah Novich. The students of the River Valley School for the Deaf just want to hook up, pass their history finals, and have politicians, doctors, and their parents stop telling them what to do with their bodies. This revelatory novel punches readers into the halls of a residential school for the deaf, where they'll meet Charlie, a rebellious transfer student who's never met another deaf person before. Austin, the school's golden boy, whose world is rocked when his baby sister is born hearing, and February, the headmistress, who is fighting to keep her school open and her marriage intact, but might not be able to do both. As a series of crises, both personal and political, threaten to unravel each of them, Charlie, Austin and February find their lives inextricable for one another and changed forever. Uh, this is written by a deaf author and um, I've been meaning to read more books about disability although I know a lot of deaf people don't identify as disabled um, but as part of a different deaf culture but it is still um, an under acknowledged and under written about under published uh, culture um, so I am looking forward to reading that one. I'm also looking forward to Little Fox's Took Up Matches by Katja Kazbek and the reason I'm interested in this one is that it uses folklore which is something that I always love in books. When Mitya was two years old, he, was swallow he swallowed his grandmother's sewing needle. For his family, it marks the beginning of the end, the promise of certain death. For Mitya, it is a small metal treasure that guides him from within. As he grows, his life mirrors the uncertain future of his country, which is attempting to rebuild itself after the collapse of the Soviet Union, torn between its past and the promise of modern freedom. Mitya finds himself facing a different sort of ambiguity. Is he a boy, as everyone keeps telling him, or is he not quite a boy, as he often feels? Mitya embarks across a journey across underground Moscow to find something better, a place to belong. His experiences are interlaced with the retelling of a foundational Russian fairy tale, Koshai the Deathless, offering an element of fantasy to the brutal realities of Mitya's everyday life. And this one also has received a lot of praise from Kaming Chang, um, James Canyon, Paul Beatty, Afia Atakora. So um, it's one that um, I think a lot of people have really loved. Um, Russian and Eastern European books are something that I want to read more of, partially because of what's currently going on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, but also partly just because I think that the Eastern Europe is um, an interesting place historically and culturally um, and it's not a place that I have read a huge amount from. Um, so yes, I'm looking forward to reading that one. Um, next uh, we have the only collection of stories on my list which is We Move by Ganaik Jahal uh, and this is um, set in West London. Beneath the plains circling Heathrow various lives connect. Pretty speaks English and her, nan her nanny Punjabi. Without Pretty's mum around they struggle to make a shared language. Not far away, Chetan and Anshi's um, relationship shifts when a woman leaves her car in their drive but never returns to collect it. Gujan's father steps out of his flat above the chicken shop for the first time in years to take his grandson on a bicycle tour of the old and changed neighbourhood. And returning home after dropping out of university, Lata grapples with, this, with a secret about her estranged family friend, and now a chart-topping rapper in, in a crisis of confidence. Mapping an area of West London, these stories chart a wider narrative about the movement of multiple generations of immigrants, bringing together the past and present, the local and the global, to show the surprising ways we come together. Now, um, now as I mentioned earlier, I'm from South East London, not from West London, um, but I still do love books that really focus in on an area of London really specifically um, because London often feels like multiple different places all right up next to one another. Now another book from Eastern Europe that I'm interested in reading is Bola by, by Peter Statovci and this one is um, about Kosovo. Um, in April 1995 Arasim is a 24 year old recently married student at the University of Pristina in Kosovo. Keeping his head down to gain a university degree in a time and place deeply hostile to Albanians. In a cafe, he meets a young man named Milos, a Serb. Before the day is out, everything has changed for both of them, and within a week, two milestones erupt in Arsim's married life. His wife announces her first pregnancy, and he begins a life in secret. 
After these fevered begin beginnings, Arsim and Milos's unlikely affair is derailed by the outbreak of war, which sends Arsim fleeing fledgling family abroad and timid Milos spiralling down a dark path, as depicted through a chaotic journal entries. Years later, deported back to Pristina after a spell in prison and now alone and hopeless, Arsim finds himself in a broken reality that makes him completely question his past. What happened to them exactly? How much can you endure and forgive? Entwined with their story is a recreated legend of a demonic serpent, Bola. It's an unearthly tale that gives Arsim and Milos a language through which to reflect on what they once said. So, as I said earlier, I like books that deal with folklore. I want to read more about Eastern Europe. And I have a friend from work who is um, an Albanian Kosovan. Um, and uh, so she's told me a lot about her history. Um, so I'd be interested in reading a book around that topic as well. Another book that deals with a, a specific, very specific geography is Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow. Joan was only a child the last time she visited Memphis. She doesn't remember the bustle of Beale Street on a summer's night. She doesn't know she is almost as likely to hear gunshots ring out as the sounds of children playing. How the smell of honeysuckle is almost overwhelming as she climbs the porch steps to the house where her mother grew up. But when the front door opens, she does remember Derek. This house full of history is home to the women of the North family. They are no strangers to adversity. Resilience runs in their blood. Fifty years ago, Hazel's husband was lynched by the all-white police squad, yet she made a life for herself and her daughters in the majestic house he built for them. August lives there still, running a salon where the neighbourhood women gather. And now this house is the only place Joan has left. It is in sketching portraits of the women in her life, her aunt and her mother, the women who come to have their hair done, the women who come to chat and gossip, that Joan begins laughing again, begins living. And this one was praised by uh, Robert Jones Jr. who wrote The Prophets, which was a book that I loved last year. Um, and he says, Tara M. Stringfellow assembles the endearing and unforgettable cast of characters who find strength in vulnerability, safety in art, and liberation in telling the truth. This is a shining splendid testimony in the vein of Gloria Naylor, Dolores Phillips, Al Ayanna Mattis and Honoré Jeffers. Next to last on my list is A Tiny Shove Upwards by Melissa Chadburn. And this one is inspired by, inspired by Filipino heritage and folklore. So right up my street. Marina Salas' life does not end the day she wakes up dead. Instead, in the course of a moment, she is transformed into the stuff of myth, the stuff of her grandmother's old Filipino stories, an aswang, a creature of mystery and vengeance. She spent her time on earth on the margins, shot like a pinball through, pinball through a childhood of loss. She was a veteran of the Child Protective Services and a survivor, but always reacting, watching from a distance, understanding very little of her own life, let alone the lives of others. Death brings her into the hearts and minds of those she has known, even her killer, as she accesses their memories and sees anew the meaning of her of her own. In her nine days as an Aswang, she, while she considers whether to extract vengeance, vengeance on her killer, she also traces back, finally able to see what led to these two lost souls to a crushingly inevitable conclusion. And this one has been praised by Gina Apostol and Lauren Groff. And the last one on my list, uh, this is Violets by Kyung Suk Shin. Uh, recently I did read books by South Korean authors for the Koreathon, which I will leave linked to the cards above if you are interested. Um, and this one is set in 1970s rural South Korea. A young girl ostracised from her community. She meets a girl called Name and they become friends until one afternoon changes everything. Following a moment of physical intimacy in a Minari field, Name violently rejects Sam, setting her on a troubling path of quashed desire and isolation. When we next meet San, age 22, as she starts a job in a flower shop, there we are introduced to a colourful cast of characters, including the shop's mute owner, the other florist, Sue Ai, and the customers that include a sexually aggressive businessman and a photographer who San develops an obsession for. Throughout, San's mo moment with Namai lingers in the back of her mind. So uh, that sounds really interesting, and it's also been praised again. Um, Francis Charles said it's Darkly beautiful, Violets explores the toll of abandonment and the relentless marginalisation of a helpless young woman. The protagonist, San, shivers with insecurity and loneliness, but still dares briefly to dream of friendship and a normal life. Shin writes of the cruelty and dangers of disempowerment and an ensuing spiral of despair. So, dark, but very interesting, that sounds. So those are 23 books that are coming out this spring for which I am excited. Let me know in the comments down below if there are any I missed out that you're excited for. Um, I'd love to know what it is that you're looking forward to um, and let me know what you thought of any of those as well, if any of those have um, in intrigued you. Thank you for watching. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and to subscribe. I put out new videos twice a week, so I'll see you again very soon. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.